in the Gospels. Jesus teaches us by using parables. Through them comes God's message in simple story form. Today a parable might begin like this. Once there was a great circus. In the march of nations and peoples, a great circus parade in which some were participants, some merely spectators. A parade in which human beings seldom knew one another or cared for one another. And into this great circus of life came a man who dared to be different.
You go to a film for an experience. It's going to stimulate thought and feeling. And feeling is, at this point, is more important than thought. Questions have been asked about the title, Parable. Originally, I had, well, I had been with this project since uh, the very beginning, the first day in New York when the uh, Protestant Council Committee got together and um, decided on making on making a film for the World's Fair. The subject matter being Jesus, light of the world. I wrote a very long script I called uh, In All My Holy Mountain. There are parts of it that are uh, used in parable, but that isn't what the council wanted. A very fine person named Lois Anderson, um, who worked for the Baptists, invited me up to um, to Green Lake, Wisconsin, to spend a week talking to the pastors and theologians and what have you from the Baptists. I found the discussions with some of their theologians and clergy very, very stimulating. My mind was working and I drove home and in the Dells, I remember, Wisconsin Dells, where there were advertisements for the Circus World Museum in the little town of Baraboo. And so it's a kind of a shrine to the American circus. I sat down and suddenly a bunch of things started coming together. Modern French artist, Georges Rouault. And he painted the faces of Christ. And then he also painted what we would call clowns. The face of Christ becomes the face of the clown. The face of the clown becomes the face. This I saw. That's where I came up with the idea for parable. There's no dialogue in parable. One noise in the picture, which is my voice. Suddenly there's a voice where there hadn't been any human voices heard. And I looked out the window and there was Manhattan. You know, and all those buildings. And I had this panoramic view. And I heard in my head the cry, the agonized cry of the clown. I looked out there and I heard that voice going out over and over and reaching over to Jersey and reaching west and getting to Chicago and San Francisco and Honolulu and Tokyo. I mean, like it's spreading out its wings over the world. Well, it sure worked. And the audience is not expecting to hear a voice and then, boom, the parable got a lot of things going. It inspired Godspell. I've also heard that it um, influenced the creators of Jesus Christ Superstar. Well, one of the most powerful men in New York was city planner Moses, Robert Moses. Robert Moses heard that a film was being edited for the Protestant Council of the City of New York for the pavilion um, showing Christ as a clown. He didn't think this was appropriate. He wanted the film out. It was great. 
because that meant that stuff about Parable hit the New York Times every day, hit the New York Herald Tribune, the news, it was news. So also, there are two factors. One, a lot of the, there were several big donors and fundraisers for the pavilion. Well, several of their donors said, if you go ahead with this project, we'll drop out. And they did. I mean, threats came, for example, from somebody from Con Ed, who had an executive position, wrote and said, if you show this film, it's quite as a clown. Nobody had seen it, of course. It wasn't finished yet. If you show this film at the fair, well, I'll, I'll see that your electricity is cut off, so you can't show it. Another, I think it was a minister from Long Island someplace, actually wrote a letter threatening, if you show the film, I'll come in with my shotgun and shoot holes in the movie screen. I mean, this is the kind of reaction it was getting. And now remember, this was 1964. That's over 50 years ago. Parable was much more controversial then than it is now because of Parable. Once the film came out with a big name, Protestant Council of the City of New York presents, they had won a huge first prize with the Catholics. I mean, it, it, it was an ecumenical kind of thing. It, it sort of bridged the barriers between different denominations and, and so forth and so on. Time magazine ran a What to See at the Fair for six months in 1964, six months, 65. And the, the first thing in their column, what to see at the fair, was um, parable. And a very good, good write-up. Newsweek magazine um, came out later in assessing the entire fair and said of the 50 films that Parable was probably, and they said probably, probably the best film at the fair. What I try to do in my films is work toward a moment of perception, what I call direct perception, a kind of epiphany, and it must, for the most part, take place in, in, a, in, in the thing the film works up to. And after, in parable, the clown goes off in the distance following the last wagon in the circus parade. There's a slow fade. And then after the picture fades out, the music continues distantly for three or four beats. And then there are a few, couple of beats of silence. That's very important. That's what I'm working for. The moment that you can't explain with just words. It's a nonverbal thing. You either see it or you don't. Sand. Sand as far as the eye can see. A single grain of sand. Not the desert or the dune, but the eye can see it more easily. And in seeing it, we can better understand this vastness. With this in mind, we tell our story.
from the summit of the highest mountain. Rain, the gardener, and Elijo. If one tries to look up there, one can see only garden. Each bloom is exquisite. Each leaf of great perfection. measured the seas and the oceans in the hollows of these hands. Who has weighed mountains with a balance and hills with a scale? To these newly created creatures, says the gardener, I give my valley. He shall be king and she shall be queen in the valley below. Only my garden is forbidden. circle of the earth so high that its inhabitants are like insects. The creatures discover the sweetness of the valley and life is idyllic save for the anxiety of being just creatures. Arousing in them a strange and unaccountable defiance, an inner stirring first felt by Bruja, who tends this garden on the valley's farther side, opposite the summit. Once, this Bruja had helped the maidens tend the gardener's garden, but always with a gnawing doubt, a lust for power. Until, rebelliously, Bruja urged the others to join and seize the garden. Reluctantly, the gardener had no choice but to drive her from the summit. And Bruja descended into the valley. Claiming a dying volcano as domain. And as the gardener's garden became naught but a memory, Bruja fashioned a garden of her own, of the stuff about. And in her sickness to be as the gardener, tried desperately to reshape her form and visage. But only half the face was sufficiently pliable to mock the gardener's eminence and sprout a growth of beard. 
so Bruja tends its garden. Half-bearded gardener, half-maiden. And its tending is confusion. In its rebellion, Bruja goads these creatures to greater distrust of the gardener. The nectar's tastier in the garden above, tempts Bruja. Fly to it. Feed of it. Power, felicity, forcefully, forcefully. Felicity. of the valley. With a tap of his thumb, he can destroy them. But he will not. Yet he cannot permit another rebellion for their destiny and for his garden. While she broods over them, the wingless kings condemned to daily toil. All born here will be wingless. Occasionally the wingless pair glance up to the mountain where the garden grows. With great longing. The tiny nest has grown into many colonies, built by generations of worker children. The old first queen is dead, her dull body dragged out of the hill by generations of her own offspring and left to rot. Days drag on, filled with digging more chambers and squeezing the juice from a laborious harvesting of seeds. Only the worship of a garden by the crater tended by an awesome being they dare not offend, relieves the monotony of the daily rounds.
Yet, the creatures are prospering, each new hill swelling their colonies. Some become builders. Why not shirk a while? Some farmers. Get yours! I'll get mine! Herds of plant lice are brought to and from pasture and milked for their honeydew. Watch out for number one. Workers carry leaves as compost for beds of especially cultivated mushrooms. Open your eyes and curse the others. The young are fed and cared for by conscientious nurses. Curse the others. Curse! Curse! Now, a greedy queen suspects that her workers are withholding the honeydew they collect for her colony. She exploits them as living storage jars. The honeydew is forced into them. Until their bellies swell to the size of agates. Now, some steal into the nurseries of their neighbors to snatch their eggs for food. Now, some capture workers to toil for them in slavery. Now, Suspicion becomes the order of life in the valley, and the hills resort to warfare, each colony falling upon the other. done so they might trust him. Living among them, becoming one of their existence, so that they might never again mistake the double-faced bruja for themselves.
humble nurse stumbles upon an egg outside an entrance to her hill. She bears it safely to a chamber. And out of the dry ground, he grew. Eliho toils among his creatures as a slave of the rulers. He comforts the nurses who are frantic because eggs have been stolen by hungry marauders. He helps the torn and the terrorized. And slowly, sluggishly, a humble few recognize his difference from themselves. Though they walk in darkness without a gleam of light, let them trust in the gardener, for they are his, and they follow him. But the multitudes fail to see for they are dazzled still by Bruja's garden. And worshipping this Bruja as gardener, the first and last. I will take care of you. But Eliho comes forth saying, I am the first and the last. Apart from me there is no gardener and no garden. And he boldly approaches the awesome Bruja, scandalizing the multitudes. The path to the garden is long. There is neither water to drink, nor a morsel to eat. shall not tempt the gardener. some garden blighted by one of kin and kind. His frightened followers warn him to avoid the vexed and populous hill. Eliho goes despite the danger, while in their fear the vagrant few who followed him play dead. Thus, they recognize his difference with affliction.
Those who followed and fled now return and drag the lifeless remains of El Hijo from the hill. To shroud him with the wings of the first king and queen as best they can. Then turn and re-enter the colony as they had so many times before, but this time with a difference. One of those, an old queen almost done with her lifespan of travail, an old queen with the new difference, crawls singly to the place where she helped bury him. She finds only the crumbled shroud of dead wings without a trace of the different one. Here on this place, she remains long enough to lay her last eggs. And the eggs hatch, and the larvae grow to spin cocoons, and the young emerge weakly. And when they've discovered that their legs are for walking, and their antennae for speaking, they discover something more. Unfolding from their bodies are wings. Among the multitudes of the valley, plant lice are still milked and mushrooms cultivated. Slaves are still kept by some and wars are frequent. Yet there's a difference. And those who know this difference are drawn into a colony unto themselves, for it carries them far beyond themselves. the summit of the highest mountain reign the gardener and Elihu. If one tries to look up there, one can see only garden. Each bloom is exquisite, each leaf of great perfection. the eye can see. A single grain of sand. Not the desert or the dune, but the eye can see it more easily. And in seeing it, we can better understand this vastness. With this in mind, we tell our story. It started out with the idea of bees. And you have an Amer uh, you know, and expression in English, um, a beekeeper. Well, what about a person who keeps ants? Well, we don't have such a person. But I thought it would be a good name, the ant keeper. It would be provocative. However, they, they're still showing this film down in Mexico. I 
uh, some museum, and they like it. But its its name is La Guardia de las Hormigas, the keeper of the ants. I was having a discussion with an official at the Lutheran Church in America in New York, um, and we were talking about uh, uh, divine creation, God's creation, what have you, and either he or I, I think he came up and said, and what are we compared with our Creator? We're like little ants. And the idea of human beings being like little ants, and there are a lot of good parallels. I mean, between an organized human society and an organized ant society, which is very highly organized. And they, um, and um, I thought it would be a way for humans to identify themselves in their helplessness, in their needfulness, in their should we say sinful state or the human condition? I didn't know the film was controversial. It wasn't controversial at all in the way parable was. Or maybe I was so used to controversy <laughs> I didn't realize that that there were these objections. I know that a lot of the critiques hit a note with certain people. I mean, they, uh, they were critics who were supposed to criticize what they saw, but they said, well, I don't like it because I don't like bugs. They give me the creeps. It's about bugs. I don't like bugs. The scenes with the ants, which are at least 50% of the picture, were shot and with great Difficulty by Robert Crandall at his studio in El Tadina, California. Other shots were made, all made in Mexico. A few were made in a studio in Mexico City. Bruja's domain with the Lavic Rock was shot in um, outside of Mexico City, an area volcanic area called El Pedregal. I directed those girls, <laughs> the four angels, three angels, whatever it is. They were wonderful girls. I loved the faces that I could get down there. This marvelous touch of Aztec or touch of water. Those faces, uh, the women. And, and the El Ijo and the... And the and the, uh, uh, the gardener. Crandall had this specially built, especially built macro cinema equipment. It was, he was doing things, photographic insects, nobody in the world was doing as well. Robert Crandall came to the attention of film critics with the Walt Disney feature film which played a lot of theater and got great reviews back in the 50s. And it was called The Living Desert. And what was the most famous was um, his shooting the mating dance of the scorpion. And gent to the center of the ring, lock those claws, lift that sting. Three legs up and the, the red and black ants, we have the war. And I think it's a great metaphor for human warfare. And then we follow it by the influence of El Hijo, the son, who comes and sacrifices himself for the ants. And that brings the red ants and the black ants together.
Why, when I was a child, did the old folks shake their heads and sigh? Things are different today. The summers were longer once with fragrant winds and evening. There were storks and chimneys then, and crickets. they tell me things are different now. Once the smallmouth bass would leap from under the lotus, snapping at dragonflies. Once there were green mosses on the river stones. Why did they tell me? Yes, I've two of everything I can handle at the pond. No, of course I don't have whales. There simply isn't room. Well, I'm sorry too. Yes, the quails and pheasants. Ground squirrels and a, and a pair of skunks. The soil aeration is perfect so far. Plenty of earthworms. Oh, and I have a pair of salamanders too. Tortoises and tadpoles. I'll have to rely on the pond nutrition for that. Yes, I'll do the best I can. Goodbye. How oh, they'd map it out for me. As far, they'd say, as the eye could see was wilderness all around. There was a lake here then where beavers toiled and deer would drink. There were lynx, they say, and bobcats too, and wild poppies blooming. Why did they map it out that way? not one for calling creatures by pet names, for sugaring the wild blood, for housebreaking the sturdy beast into a neurotic shadow of myself. I like a falcon's talons to stay sharp. The sulfur dioxide content of the air at 3.42 p.m. today is 0.42 parts per million. The lead content of the air is 6 micrograms per cubic meter. The carbon monoxide content is 28 parts per million. In the downtown area, 328 and 40 seconds, the noise pollution at the corner of Main and High Streets was recorded at 90... We are of the same stuff, these creatures and I, of the same wild elements combined in a chemistry of spit 
and sperm and the spirit to survive. And whether microbe or man, our relation to nature approximates that of a fish to water. Until I sealed it off in glass, this pond was dying like a water hole in drought. But I nursed it back to health from my junkyard of pumps and paraphernalia, revived it in an iron lung of filtered air, trussed and braced it in the coils of a water distillery. Each earthworm nurtured, each life cell succored. Yet it is more much more than a puddle within a ramshackle whitewashed glass. In this one shallow pond, I know the depth of all the salty seas. In my small pond vibrates a billion years of the birth of our vast planet. When our Earth was merely a molten lump, cooling after too much fire, sprays over a cindery planet, living organisms rode on pseudopods and pogo sticks, trumpeting, here will I grow, here will I grow. multiplied by millions, at times bizarre, but never useless. of life, 
All the rivers run back into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Into the place from where the rivers come, they return again. shallow pond, in this small water's wet is an echo. Here will I grow. Here will I grow within this ramshackle of whitewashed glass. I don't know where they came from, where they breed. I know only that they're destroying the life of my pond, and with it, I myself am dying in proportion. How like human beings they are in their senseless destructiveness, in their greed. Only man is more ruthless. That cloud of foul air hanging over us is the breath of human greed. And we can blame nothing else for our predicament, not even the rat. Oh, for a hungry hawk or a wise old barn owl. I'd prepared for another collecting trip to the world outside. But at the last moment, I lost nerve. Somehow, I'd been here too long. I'd become a kind of hothouse human. In staying, I know that I'll remain here as long as is humanly possible, using all the skills I have in rebuilding the life family of this pond, if that can be done. Perhaps the nature of a life family is too complex to control, much less synthesize. Despite many setbacks, the pond is beginning to thrive again.
Martin. Operator, I want the police. Downtown area at 9.15 a.m. The noise pollution at the corner of Main and High Streets was recorded at 100 to Operator, this is an emergency. Decimal peaking at 120. This report has been recorded. The carbon monoxide content is 30. Through this deluge, there emerges a last man, a Noah to carry on. That Noah must be all of us. Even then, the outcome is uncertain. All we know for sure is that the 40 days and 40 nights of this deluge of pollution and erosion and destruction began centuries ago. Now we are living through and dying through its last hours on this ark called Earth. map it out for me. As far, they'd say, as the eye could see was wilderness all around. There was a lake here then where beavers toiled and deer would drink. There were lynx, they say, and bobcats too, and wild poppies blooming. Why did they map it out that way? So the problem, as I saw it, in the environment was a moral and some of that is coming out right now. Uh, uh, the current pope is losing uh, uh, people in the Roman church because he's coming out so strongly for the morality involved not only in pollution of the environment, but, you know, global warming, all that. So I said, this is a moral problem. And what is a Christian response to it? Should, should it be? And then I got the idea of this man uh, who builds a greenhouse. And Until I sealed it off in glass, this pond was dying like a water hole in drought. But I nursed it back to health from my junkyard of pumps and paraphernalia. And that's where I got the idea of Ark. And this man was a, a kind of Noah. It opened as a short subject at the Los Feliz Theater in old Hollywood. And, and it was reviewed by Charles Champlin, who was a crack 
film and theater critic for the LA Times. And it was shown in um, either big cities or college towns. After you see the film, ask yourself in that the uh, telephone scene. The telephones, the way they're used in that, are the only thing that date the film. Nothing else dates it. But who is he talking to? And I want, I don't want to say, I want the audience to say, if, if they break through that one, they get more out of the picture. Yes, I've two of everything I can handle at the pond. No, of course I don't have whales. There simply isn't room. And ARC people want to see it again and again since the uh, 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 internet came out and the Facebook, the computers, and people can get a hold of me. Um, I've got letters and emails and what have you from from people who say, I saw ARC 30 years ago in a classroom, in a science classroom in Pomona or, or uh, you know, Fayetteville or someplace, Peoria, Illinois. They, and I, I haven't never forgotten it. I got a letter, very carefully written, handwritten letter on very nice stationery, about three pages, from an Indian woman, Amer by Indian I mean Native American woman, who wanted to know where she could get a print because she had seen it years ago. It was the only thing she seed, had seen that it corresponded with the Native American concept of the environment and the sacredness of the world we live in. And they've lost, I feel, the sense of moral responsibility. And that's what Ark is about. The man, like Noah in the scripture, is made to feel, or feels on his own, responsible. And in that sense of responsibility, wants to do something about it. And the people who come at the end are you and me, are our neighbors. It's still a moral issue. They don't want to do something about it, and they resent the people who do.
and the violence is escalating at an alarming pace. A new dimension has been added to neighborhood skirmishes with car bombs and parcel bombs. Though the fighting has subsided in some townships, this is not to be taken as a ceasefire, and I repeat, this is not to be taken as a ceasefire. Families are warned to remain in their houses with doors securely locked, answering to no one. The numbers of barricades set up in parks, playgrounds, and picnic groves is increasing the no-go areas. Terrorists on both sides are determined to root each other out in a prepare-to-kill, prepare-to-die policy. Assassination squads are roaming the neighborhoods as terrorist groups splinter into warring among themselves, and snipers on either side are everywhere, adding a wave of indiscriminate killing, including that of children who happen to be in the wrong neighborhood at the wrong time.
and have no love and have no love and have no One Friday was not made for the church. The fact that it has a religious theme and that I used St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians about faith, hope, and charity uh, is because I couldn't help it. I can't help but making it somewhat, somewhat religious, even if I don't intend to. The baby in the picture was uh, a little over two years old. And the violence is escalating at an alarm. Uh, it's amazing how many things he did that we couldn't make him do, but he did spontaneously. Like one of the victims of the neighborhood wars, the corpse is hanging in the tree. It's a high angle shot, and the baby is running after the dog. He stops and looks up. We couldn't get him to do that. He did it. And there are some things I wish I could shoot over, but very few. Now, I was in New York seeing a lot of my friend Roy Inman, who plays the guy in the African tip in Parable. One Friday, the idea came from an evening I had in, when I was living in New York. Uh, while in Chicago, I was a, for a while I was a TV, television director, producer. And during that period, I really missed the theater. So I volunteered and became director of a all African American theater and ran uh, workshops for them, you know, theater workshops and improv stuff and uh, building techniques and all of that. And so I felt very close to the African-American community. I was kind of pretty much accepted. That theater, which then called itself Drama Incorporated, and the woman who ended up running it, Joan Brown, has since become the black theater in Chicago. So Roy and I would go, and we'd often go to parties, I'd be invited through Roy, that were primarily African American. And this was a period in the 60s. And the thing is, there were some very, very militant young African Americans who believed, sincerely believed, there was going to be a revolution. 
neighborhood by neighborhood, city by city, farm by farm, the black community was going to take over. And one actually, one fellow I liked, as met before, said, trying to make his point, said, uh, um, you know, I may have I may have to kill you, man. I may have to kill you and your family. But we got it. We got to make our statement. But when he got into killing me and my family, and I had this little kid who appears in the film, and I was very happily married, and it just hit me because I'd always worked in my way for civil rights, if that's, and it was around the time the bill was being passed or had just been passed. It was a time when the Black Panthers were making news, you know. Well, I was kind of hurt by this. And what's gonna solve it? I mean, we can't have racial warfare, neighborhood by neighborhood. And this is what they were talking about. And out of that thinking came the film. And, and the words of Paul of Tarsus, St. Paul, from the letter to the Corinthians, the, be, being in effect but the most important thing, Paul was a good writer, by the way. I mean, his writing is very good, some of it. But he ends it by saying, you know, there, he was led by faith, hope, and love, charity or love. And the, but the greatest of these is love. 